Welcome to the Dairy News and Views podcast, a production of the Iowa State University Extension and Outreach Dairy Team. Our podcast covers current educational, research, and industry tools available for your operation to manage healthy cows and calves while producing the highest quality dairy products. For joining us today on Dairy News and Views from the ISU Dairy Team, I'm Jen Bentley, Northeast Iowa Dairy Field Specialist, and today I'm here with our Extension Dairy Team colleagues, Dr. Gail Carpenter, Dr. Phil Jardin, and Fred Hall as we recap a webinar we recently hosted on feeding for protein and profit. And so today we're happy to have on our call today, Dr. Atwell from Edisio. Uh, Dr. Atwell is a dairy technical and business development lead for the upper Midwest and Western US. And he joins our discussion here today as we talk about how to increase the yield of milk protein pounds in the tank. So welcome back to the podcast dairy team and welcome to our podcast, Dr. Atwell. It's always great to be here, Jen. Gail, yeah, let's go ahead and start. Kind of explain the uh, milk fatty acid research and uh, rumen fermentation and its relationship to milk protein. So I, uh, yeah, I kind of started our my portion of the webinar with some discussion on milk fatty acids and not just total amount of milk fatty acids, but what the specific form of these fatty acids are. So. Um, we break these down generally uh, into de novo fatty acids or preformed, or you might also have heard them called dietary fatty acids. Um, and that's just a fancy science way of saying de novo fatty acids are the ones that the cows make herself, and the preformed dietary fatty acids are the ones she, that she gets from the diet or from mobilizing her own body fat. And the way we kind of break down and decide which is which, if it's a de novo or if it's a, if it's preformed, is going to be based on. Um, based on the chain length or how long that fatty acid is. So the reason that I, I mean, it sounds a little bit counterintuitive to start a milk protein talk talking about fatty acids, um, but I think some of the really interesting stuff that's come out in the past few years, especially out of the Northeast, um, and Dave Barbano and his group up at Cornell, some of the interesting stuff that's come out about these de novo fatty acids is that they're really highly correlated to um, rumen health, and they're a good indicator of um, how healthy that rumen is and, and if we're doing a good job of keeping those rumens happy. And the reason we want a happy rumen is we want, um, we want high components, both fat and protein. So that rumen health is gonna be driving microbial crude protein production, which is a great source of amino acids for the mammary gland as well. So a lot of times I think when we're talking about um, milk components and high milk protein, um, and high milk fat, it really comes back to some of that basic rumen management and making sure we're keeping those rumens happy. So I haven't seen um, de novos used as a tool as much out in the Midwest. And uh, Dr. Jordan and Dr. Atwell, you're a little bit more national than I am, so you might be able to speak to this a little bit better. Um, I've seen de novos used by producers as a tool, a benchmarking tool, more in the Northeast, um, maybe not so much in the Midwest, but um, folks in the Northeast have been looking at it a bit more in terms of um, being able to, to kind of look at, at farms on a bulk tank level uh, and say, you know, am I, am I high or low in these de novos um, and use that as kind of a starting point a lot of times for making some of these um, management and nutrition decisions. So uh, it's kind of a kind of a cool new thing, but it's a it's a great, great tool. Um, so to come back to those room and that that room and health and, and the happy rumens and that's something that I we talk about happy cows coming from California I think uh, happy rumens come from Iowa so <laughs> well I think the main reason it's in the Northeast is because Dr Barbano at uh, Cornell I'm a food actually food scientist right. uh, did a lot of their pioneering work with that and uh, so it's they're naturally uh, in an area where that's uh, been around a little bit longer yeah they're really excited about it up there. Yeah. I have seen um, I have seen a company uh, that Michelle Baldwin used to work for, and they had an app put together where people were uh, could input data from a creamery and, uh, you know, analyze for um, de novo and so forth, put that into the app and, and make some decisions about how the diet was working. So, Ooh. yeah, that and that's been around for, well, I don't know, five or six years. I don't I don't see. It's not a monster company in the upper Midwest, um, but um, 
you know, I know that they have some people who use that. And uh, other than that, I have not seen a lot of people in the upper Midwest, um, and Phil, you'd be better for California or the West, uh, use the use it anywhere near like they do in the Northeast because of Cornell's influence. So. Yeah. But I think, you know, whether or not you're testing for de novo fatty acids doesn't mean that um, we can't, stand, can't still take home some of the messages about managing for good rumen health. And a lot of times that comes back to pushing up feed, feeding frequently, um, particle size, stocking density, a lot of these really basic management practices. Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit more. I think all of us on the call here get on farms routinely, right? So you see things that happen on dairies. Um, you see some good management practices that are related to feed management and not always on the paper, right? So you get the get the ration on the paper, but what's actually going out in the barn? So maybe we could just kind of go around and kind of see what you're seeing out in the field. Yeah, one of the things I always tell my students is that cows can't read. Um, so they can, they, you can, you can balance the most perfect ration in the world, but they don't know what that says. And so what really counts is the, you know, kind of back to, you know, your nutrition 101, it's the ration on paper, the ration in the bunk and the ration that the cow actually eats. And she's making milk off of the ration that she actually eats. Um, so to me, I think a lot of this comes back to feed availability um, and two really two low hanging fruits that I see uh, a lot of times are feed push up um, and stocking density. And I think there's a tendency to really want to um, maximize milk by maximizing cows and just pack more cows into barns. And I think sometimes we can actually get more milk out of the barn with fewer cows if we're not overstocking. And I'm not saying we should be stocking farms at 100% or 90% or anything like that. Um, but I think if you're talking about, you know, 150% stocking density, you're, you're pushing it. Um, I'm comfortable at more of that, uh, you know, 110% stocking density. Um, making sure that cows have a place to lay down uh, and making sure that they have access to the feed bunk. Um, and then feed push up. Um, I know that's automated more at a lot of farms. Um, you know, there's, uh, Laylee's got their Junos and there's other feed push-up technologies that can be used to automate it. Um, and, but even if you don't have access to that automated technology, making sure that you're not, um, not skimping on your feed push-ups. It can be one of those things that, you know, as you have other stuff going on, it's one of those things that's easy to say, oh, I'll do that after I get this done, or I'll do that after I get that done. And, um, especially when we're talking about dry cows or heifers or, or cows that aren't in the lactating barn. The lactating barn, if you're going to push up feed, a lot of times you're going to do the lactating barn first, but those dry cows need feed access as well, especially those close-up cows too. Um, so making sure that they can that they can reach their feed and that they have access to, access to laying space and access to um, feed bunk space, I think is really important. I'm going to back up and go just that step before the feed gets to the bunk. Uh, here recently, you know, we need to look at a watch. When we load that mixer wagon, there's a time period that it needs to mix. If you're too short, you can see it in the bunk. If you get sidetracked, you're doing nine other things, uh, you can see that in the bunk too. So I always want to stand and, and watch how that TMR is put together and mixed because you can walk down the bunk line and see some differences. I think if you're seeing differences in particle side at one end of the bunk and the other, that's probably a good sign that you didn't mix it long enough. Yeah, I'll chime in here too with uh, another thing is keeping the mixer wagons uh maintained well. Mm -hmm. One of the big things I see is the kicker plate wearing out and you get this kind of donating effect with the, uh, where you don't get the mix and no matter how long you mix it, it's not going to mix. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to keep it maintained well. Yeah, this, this, all these things that you're talking about are critical and they're more important than all the minor things like in my world of amino acid balancing. Um, you know, if you're not getting the, uh, I, I call it the meat and potatoes of dairying done, you know, you could very well be wasting your money on, you know, various things that you're going to buy. And, and uh, I think as, uh, 
Uh, I don't know. I'm not in the extension world, but I do speak to dairymen and I have for a long time about various topics and we can get the, um, you can feel like when you're talking about these things that they're not real sexy, they're not real exciting and all that. But, you know, whenever you find a dairy that's doing 100 pounds Holstein herd, that's at 100 or more. These are the things that are getting done right all the time, every day, you know, by by uh, high quality people. And uh, I never want to lose sight of that. And I think I never want to make that assumption. Feed is being pushed up. Or, it's really something that uh, has to be checked all the time, and uh, it's it's super critical. Uh, I had a friend a long time ago say to me that dairy nutrition was maybe 30% of the equation. 70% is what goes on in the farm, the management, what a man or a woman does when they get out of bed in the morning. And uh, I, I agree with that. It took me a long time to get that, but I do agree with that. <laughs> Yeah, I think it can be hard for us as nutritionists to admit that sometimes that uh, <laughs> that what we do is not going to be successful um, if we don't have the management right as well. I think Fred has said this in other podcasts. It kind of goes back. We're in the people business, right? So yeah. how are we managing those that are managing the cows? It's pretty critical to the overall operation. And I would just um, add in there, kind of going back to Gail's point about, you know, the feed push up. Um, a few years ago, we did some time-lapse camera uh, information where we put some time-lapse cameras into some dairies. Um, it was really kind of interesting, you know, looking at um, when cows are running out of feed. And producers really didn't realize that until they started looking at that time-lapse camera and realized, oh, those cows are actually out of feed a lot sooner than I thought. So, you know, some of that technology, too, can be implemented just to kind of see what's going on in the barn when you're not even in the barn. Yep. So, yep, very, very important. Alternate uses for trail cams, right? So. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I definitely understand the, the desire to want to feed to a slick bunk, especially with feed prices the way they are right now and not wanting to have too many refusals. Um, but I think it's really important to make sure that you're managing that. Um, if you're feeding at four o'clock and if you get there at four o'clock in the morning to feed, um, it's easy to think that cows you know, the bug's only been slick for a little while, but if it's been, you know, four or six hours, then that's going to be a different story for, for those cows. Let's kind of move forward and talk about what a typical Midwest diet looks like and what does it mean for an amino acid profile? Uh, Dr. Atwell. Okay. Um, I guess uh, from my standpoint with amino acid balancing, what I, what I wanted to get across to people is that particularly in the upper Midwest, you can have a very high degree of confidence that if you correctly balance for amino acids, you can get a very good response in terms of uh, both fat and protein. And uh, so um, that's one thing I, I think you can be very confident about it. Then it comes down to a number of things. Um, that you want to take a look at. And that is, what are the targets that you shoot for for amino acids? You've got to be using a uh, ration balancing program that has a good model in it, which is going to be either NRC based or uh, CNCPS from Cornell. And um, I guess uh, rather than rattle off a whole bunch of numbers, the, uh, you will have uh, uh, access to the PDF that I did that shows uh, what uh, what we, and I don't think we're really that unusual in terms of uh, what, what Cornell or, or somebody uh, like Chuck Schwab, uh, an NRC guy would say, uh, what the targets ought to be for the diet. And then you can manipulate the diet with, um, particularly in the world of uh, methionine and lysine because there are bioavailable um, room and protected uh, products available that you can use to manipulate the diet. Um, and, and I've got to throw in a plug for Adiseo. I think we have the best <laughs> and most consistent products and then shoot for those targets. And, uh, the, be another beauty about, uh, amino acids is that if you do it correctly, you're going to see the difference in anywhere from a week to two weeks. If you don't see a difference, um, then you need to, uh, to rethink, what did I do? Did I do something wrong? Because particularly in this upper Midwest market, um, our diets, whether you're high alfalfa or high corn silage, they're generally always first limiting or uh, most efficient in methionine in terms of the essential amino acids. So, 
Maybe that'll bring up a couple questions from you guys. No? Well, here in the Midwest, we feed a lot of corn products. Yep. So are, are, isn't corn fairly high in methionine? It or is. is it high is, enough? It is, Phil, but um, also if, the, if uh, the audience will take a look at that PDF, I have a high example of a high corn salad diet and a high alfalfa, and you'll see that um, both of them are, um, are deficient in methionine. I think if you look at the diet, it's really not unusual. It's very common, uh, common diets uh, that are fed in the upper Midwest. And uh, actually, I think they're, they're, as they stand alone before they're balanced for amino acids, they're, they're really pretty good diets that produce a lot of milk. So um, even though we have corn silage, corn, um, some distillers or uh, canola meal, um, we're still usually deficient in methionine. And um, out West in the Central Valley, we discussed this a little bit, but that's a different world where you have very low forage diets and the degree of supplementation of byproducts is enormous compared to the upper Midwest. There might be seven to nine pounds of canola meal along with some distillers and um, you know corn grain and so forth. And your basal methionine would be higher out west and out west i'd say most the most limiting thing that people are dealing with would be first lysine and then methionine but we're uh, in the upper midwest it's almost always methionine so and then and then lysine so let's kind of go back to some basics what are amino acids and why are they important well, um, I'll, I'll, t I'll take a first shot at that before other people chime in. But obviously, amino acids are the building blocks of protein. And cows actually have re requirements for amino acids, not crude protein, not metabolizable protein. It's amino acids. And so uh, over the, it's been researched, the amino acid area has been researched for close to 50 years now, really. And particularly the ones that the two essential amino acids that dairy researchers have looked at is methionine and lysine over the years. And so these sophisticated models have been developed um, and allow us to more precisely determine what that cow is going to see uh, in terms of amino acids exiting the rumen. Okay. And we're able to do a much better job than we did in, say, 1985 of determining what happens to feeds in the rumen and what's going to make it through the rumen and make it into the uh, small intestine for, uh, for the cow of amino acids and with microbial protein too, a microbial amino acid. So um, it, it becomes very important to recognize that, that the cow has a requirement for amino acids, not crude protein, not metabolizable protein. And so when a person balances for amino acids, they need to generally, to begin with, reformulate the diet to take that into account. And in, in general, in our industry, metabolizable protein, which we're usually using now as a basis rather than crude protein, um, is overfed. And it's overfed because, well, one reason would be is you're, you're not precisely delivering the amino acids a cow needs, so you overfeed uh, metabolizable protein to get to that. Once you start to really hone in and dial in amino acid requirements, you don't have to feed as much MP. And so I recommend that people reformulate and it's not radical. Again, in uh, refer to the PDF I, um, I provided, it shows the difference between an original diet and an amino acid balanced diet. It's not a radical change, but you can put uh, in the one example, I put 55 cents worth of amino acids into a diet, but I only changed the price of the diet six cents because I was able to reformulate and lower the metabolizable protein that the guy was uh, um, had in the diet. And, uh, and it's a similar situation with the alfalfa diet. The numbers are different. I think it was somewhere around 37 cents and it increased the, the ration cost by eight cents. So it's critical to not only from a nutrition uh, standpoint, what we understand about nutrition and using the latest information in terms of uh, amino acid nutrition, but also to save money for the producer to do it the most economical way. So reformulation is important. Once you get, once you get a handle on it in your system, it's not, I don't think it's difficult. So, and then obviously 
any any of the folks that you know from my company, from Adesayo, we would love to help you do that. So that's what we do all the time. I know we talked earlier about the, the de novo fatty acids. I know one thing people get with their DHA reports, uh, mercury and nitrogen. Do you have a guideline on how low we can get with them UNs? You know, I don't I don't have a different number than what you would hear from the various extension services, which I believe would be probably you want to shoot in the nine to 13 range from from uh, mercury and nitrogen. I'd also caution to say that I wouldn't say that MUNs are the most accurate and sensitive thing to use. I think the number is if it goes high, it's higher. If it goes low, it went lower. But is it seven or is it nine? I don't know if that's that's the way I've always looked at MUNs. I okay. I don't uh, yeah I wouldn't um, be, that wouldn't be my first criteria to look at you know I think that the like I said the trend if it goes up it did probably increase if it goes down it goes down but whether I am you know dead on at the thirteen point five I would be a little worried about that so. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think it. I think MUNs help tell a story, um, but there's so much that goes into them, and, and like you said, they fluctuate. They fluctuate based on time of day and um, time. Uh, there, there's so much that goes into it besides just uh, just dietary protein and dietary amino acids. That I think it's part of the story, but isn't necessarily all of the story. If it's severely low or severely high, that's definitely a red flag. Um, but if it's kind of borderline, I don't, unless there's other stuff going on, um, that's when you, I would start to get a little bit worried about it, so. Yeah. The, the other thing that I mentioned in, uh, in my uh, talk was that there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of sources. It's a crowded market now, the rumen protected amino acid market. So people have a lot of choices. They have to decide whether they believe me or some other guy that's talking to them about uh, the quality of our products. And so you really need to do your homework on bioavailability of the amino acid. Just because something has 80% DL-methionine in it doesn't mean that the cow is gonna see that. And so you have, to, you have to do your homework on bioavailability and you have to calculate what is the cost per uh, gram of metabolizable methionine, the methionine that's actually gonna get into the blood of the cow as opposed to uh, what the price per ton is or something like that. Uh, that becomes very critical. Um, and uh, I mean, that to me, I, I have a slide, I, I call that the 800 pound gorilla that's in the room. You've got to get that together because you can waste a lot of money um, or lose a lot of uh, opportunity um, if you just go with the, uh, um, the bioavailability numbers that somebody puts out there. And uh, one of the benefits, if you talk to anybody from Adesayo is we have run almost all these products through the same assay. So we do have an apples to apples comparison rather than this one was done with selenium, this was done on a bench top, this was done through the cow. Um, I know that's kind of a pain in the neck to look into all that stuff, but it is, it is really critical to select the best product and, uh, and um, to get the, the maximum benefit for the buck, so. Okay, we've really focused on dialing in our amino acid nutrition, but you know, I'm a milk marketing guy, so I'm saying protein is up a buck 40 from what it was of several months ago. I want more protein in my milk. How does all this help me do that? Well, generally, um, in research, whether it's research numbers or um, we we do demonstrations in the in the country where we would um, work with a guy to get amino acid balanced diet into the herd for 30 days to take a look at what happens, so a person can evaluate. Did, does this work on my farm in my circumstances under the under the scenario of how I get paid? And in general, I would use a number of uh, point a point of protein and a point of fat increase uh, when you amino acid balance. I'm going to say that that is a baseline. People do get higher than that, but that's what I would be looking to see and use that as an evaluation of, um, you know, whether you're going to get uh, or what 
what the impact would be of you amino acid balancing as a producer. I'm, what, what is a point of protein and a point of fat worth to me? And I can't really say for milk volume, that's all over the board, depending on what the original diet was. Uh, could be in general in research. Um, I think we had, we have a, an average of about three and a half pounds of milk, but I've seen that be no change in, in flow to a little bit of a change in flow and increase uh, with amino acid balancing. Again, it just depends on what the original diet was set up. But it is pretty, pretty, uh, we have a pretty good record in the upper Midwest for sure of increasing fat and protein uh, along the levels that I talked about, either that, either that high or more. And you have to, the other thing is when you do amino acid balancing and you're looking particularly for fat and protein in the diet, or excuse me, in the milk, you need to keep in mind what's going on seasonally. From July, from July to January, you're going to increase in milk protein about 0 0.03 every month and fat 0 0.05. And the same thing is going to happen in decline from January to July. So you might, you got to factor that in. Uh, you know, a person might do something like amino acid balance in March and their protein doesn't change or, or it changes, I don't know, let's just say it changes a half a point or a little bit more than that. And the guy will say, well, I didn't get my point. Well, but you would have dropped even more than that because it's declining during that time of year. Likewise, you have to make sure that you don't give us or somebody else credit for what's going on in the fall. You have to, because you are going to go up based on day length. So, and it's opposite in the, uh, in the Southern hemisphere, it's kind of just like the toilet twirl, twir twirls around the opposite way in the Southern hemisphere. Uh, amino acid balancing is, uh, you'll never forget that, that I said that now. So. <laughs> anyway, anyway, it's kind of cool the way it is just the opposite because of daylight. Yeah, I think that's something that we talk about a lot this time of year is that, you know, we expect, and well, we don't talk about it as much this time of year. We think in the fall that we're doing a great job um and some of it's just going to happen anyway because because of that circadian rhythm and seasonality um but uh yeah i think back to fred's question about you know you're trying to get more get more protein in the bulk tank i think a lot of it kind of sometimes is starts with those basics and make sure you're really nailing those basics and to dr outwell's point um you're not going to get the full benefit of your investment into amino acid balancing if you're not um, if you don't have the meat and potatoes, as he says, of the of the feed management in place too. So um, I know it's not always it's not always super sexy, um, but making sure that we're that we're doing things the way that we know we're supposed to be doing them, and we're not letting things slip, and we're not having any sort of um, procedural drift when it comes to things like feed push up um, and uh, and feed management. Um. I'll throw this out for like the producers in the audience. I would be, I would be uh, dissatisfied if I didn't have a protein number of three one in the summer, and three three in the winter. Okay, because that's that's a. I would say I've got a I've got a place I can go, and there's certainly people who are higher that than that in the Holstein world. But if you're not there, then find out because you can be, and there, yeah. find out what's going on and make the corrections or changes because you could be making more money and your cows can do better, so. Yeah. Well, I think it was a great conversation here today. Appreciate everybody being on the call and Dr. Atwell for joining our podcast here today. Any last uh, wrap up comments from the group? Well, thanks for having us today, Jen. Yeah. It's great to have the discussion and, and great to bring a guest on board. As much as I love talking to my colleagues, um, it's fun to fun to bring a guest in as well. Thank you for the invitation. It was uh, interesting, a lot, a lot of fun to talk about. Yeah, and as Dr. Atwell mentioned, we will include the uh, PDF of the presentation from the webinar, as well as the link to the, the archived webinar if people wanna go back and view the webinar or look at the PDF for some of those um, detailed numbers that you were referring to today. So again, thanks for joining us today and we look forward to visiting with you on the next Dairy News and Views from ISU. This institution is an equal opportunity provider. For the full non-discrimination statement or combination inquiries, go to www.extension.iastate.edu/diversity/ext.